uh, and I got to run to the Caps game soon. So, um, well, hopefully this won't take too long. But I wanted to show you guys um, my template. I'm actually working on this because I got these uh, new libraries, which I'm very, very happy with. And you have to set them all up. So I figured I'd show you guys how I do that. Let me just check that this stream is actually working both on YouTube and on the periphery page, which it should be. Looks like we are good there. And um, since it's just me, I'm going to do my best to sort of uh, look at the comments from time to time. But it's, uh, it's a bit tricky to have your eyes in all places. So um, let's see. There we go. I think I've got comments here. This shows those comments there, and all right, yep. Hello, and hello. All right, cool. So yeah, I'm trying to do. Yes, I am reading this. All right, so um, I've prepared very, very, very quickly just some material and unfortunately this isn't actually showing most of the articulations just because I ended up doing this with the legato patches but let's take a little listen through it's really just thrown together so um I apologize if this isn't you know mind-blowing or anything but I, I really just wanted to have some stuff to show you uh the two main libraries that I'm using for this are um well the two only libraries I'm using is, uh, Spitfire Chamber Strings which is a complete set of all the the string sections it's actually smaller string sections uh chamber size and uh the uh spitfire um here, expand uh symphonic brass as you can see here um and that's all i've got right now um i'll probably be adding more to this in the coming days and i could maybe show you that once i have that complete but anyways let's have a listen through And that's all I've got so far. So yeah, I know it's just like kind of random ideas thrown together, but you know, it's a it's a good starting point. So um, I think uh, I got some questions about the legato patches. I don't know, maybe. Anyways, uh, the legato patches are honestly like that's probably what would separate a really good library from um, kind of an entry level or something that would just sort of come with a, a program. It's probably just like a long long patch and you can sort of play as many notes so legato it's basically simulating um like on the string for example it's actually like playing the intervals between the notes and they recorded all of that so that when you go from one note let's see if i can uh get sound here oh yeah i have to actually select that
So you can hear how there's a little transition. They actually recorded all those transitions and it's kind of being pasted in between the notes in real time. Um, and they even have like uh, on this particular library, this is a uh, Spitfire Chamber Strings library. And I really like this because this, this first patch here, I'm on Violins 1 uh, Legato Performance. And it's sort of uh, depending on how you play and what you program will switch the kind of legato. So right now I've got, uh, I've got bowed, bowed legato here. I've got fingered, so fingered legato is when you just, the, the bow is staying up, uh, so if you hit it light, you get the portamento where it slides into the note. Um, and then they have these uh, fast articulation, and then they have the runs, which is like really slurred, but makes it sound realistic for those kinds of things. And that's that's one thing I feel like only libraries recently have started to do a good job with. That's honestly like there's not that many string libraries that are sort of agile like that, um, where they can handle really fast lines um, realistically. So that's something that I really like. Um, anyway, so let's take a look at this. Um, let's start with violins one. And again, I apologize. This is programmed so fast that it's probably messy and there's probably a few legato transitions I didn't do right. So for legato to work, it needs to sort of detect a note so that it transfers to it. Um, if you hear this, like, like that's not a legato transition, but here, let's start from the middle. It has to overlap a little bit. Uh, I played in this line, so it's like kind of sloppy and I quantized it. Um, but what we have here, you can see at the bottom here, I don't know if that's kind of hard to read, it might be on Facebook, which is why I'm also doing this on YouTube where it will be in better quality. And I'm sure I could have actually optimized Cubase to make this a little bit darker. But I've got my different articulations here. So um, I've got these two legato things. One is more based for like actually playing in notes, legato performance, and then the other one is uh, kind of easier for programming and has that runs articulation built into it. So that's really handy because uh, with a lot of other libraries, I'd probably have to make my own articulations for that. And then we've got uh, spiccato and staccato, which are both, um, here, let's, uh, let's just select that. So if I do that, no, this should be. So spiccato is this really, really short, kind of aggressive, aggressively played uh, short notes. Um, Staccato is slightly longer. Um, and then you've got your long. Wait, that's not actually changing, is it? There we go. So yeah, we didn't even hear staccato. And for these, these are uh, polyphonic, as you can see. The legato is monophonic, though it can be polyphonic, but we'll get into that later. And uh, anyways, what I'm basically doing here is, you know, you can select any number of notes and change the, their articulation. So this first one will be legato. Right, let's make that spiccato. Um, we can make it long, though with the overlaps it'll sound messy. But... And that's interestingly enough what I would sort of associate with a cheaper library because it's not actually doing this monophonic thing and um, it's, it's allowing two notes to play at once and it's not triggering the transition from note to note. Um, then we have Consordino, which is a uh, a long so consordino is basically they put a mute on the bridge of the the instrument in this case the violin and it gives it kind of a softer like less in your face sound um so i'm not using the consordinos in this at all and it's really sort of a situational thing um especially if you're mixing it with um other instruments like and in, in heavier stuff it probably won't cut through in the way you want 
But uh, and there's like a ton more uh, articulations that come with this program. I'm just like sort of narrowing it down to the ones I think I would use most of the time, just so I have them there. But um, let's see. Then we've got uh, tremolo. Again. I actually think there is a legato tremolo patch, but you know, I don't know how much I'm going to use that. Uh, oh, flaut, flautando, which is where it makes it sound like a flute. It's a really specific uh, articulation that I've only really ever seen Spitfire do. But um, it's one of the prettiest. It's one of the prettiest patches. Like, uh... I think it's very beautiful. Um... And it's definitely for softer dynamics. Um, oh, then we have a pizzicato, which I'm sure you guys at least recognize that sound, even if you don't recognize the articulation name. I actually switched to that at the end of this uh, this little demo on the violas and uh, violin two section. Uh, and oh yeah, this is actually at the bottom here because not every patch shares this and I try to keep it sort of consistent because then it should actually translate across the different instruments um, if you have your articulation set, but this staccato dig, um, it's um, just a very aggressive staccato. It's like if you want those Hans Zimmer style like, you know, that kind of stuff very aggressive for that all right um let's see questions 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 did i just go like way too advanced for everyone because i'm seeing like what vst this is so these are uh right now we're looking at um spitfire chamber strings which is a contact instrument all of all of my orchestral stuff pretty much is contact instruments so as you can see i've got like all these libraries here and I have my patches set up, set up here, and this is actually something that's unique to Cubase. So I'm using Cubase for those of you who don't recognize the DAW. And uh, the reason that I like Cubase for composing, and I, I actually notice a lot of composers use Cubase, is because there's a lot of very, very handy tools for uh, composing. So one thing that I use, this, this thing at the bottom here, this is an expression map that I made. Um, and I'm basically loading in these individual articulations um, so as you can see, legato performance, performance legato, short spiccato, short staccato dig, short staccato, long, long CS tremolo. So I loaded all that stuff in, you know, you can see all the articulations there. And then what you can do is you go to expression map, expression map setup. And over here, I know this all looks super confusing, <laughs> but, um, but I basically created, uh, 10 slots for my 10 articulations here. Uh, and I named them, and here's how they're going to appear, um, both in the score, if I export a score, and in the actual description of the articulations. And all that I did was I set these to the different channels. So they're all going to the contact instrument that it's assigned to. Um, and I have these set to trigger just the lowest, lowest note. Oh, staccato dig was not triggering. So we weren't even listening to that. I love it when I mess up. Um, <laughs> staccato dig should be four. All right. Anyways, we'll deal with that later. But um, actually, maybe you guys can see me fix this because then that might show you what I'm doing. So staccato dig should be channel four. Yep. Short staccato dig. So that's channel four. I'm just having it trigger the lowest note because I'm never going to hit that note, um, especially not playing a violin. Um, and basically what it's saying is that when I select this staccato dig thing here, that it'll, it'll change to that articulation. And as you can see, now we're getting sound out of that one. And now that was tremolo there. So now it's going to trigger tremolo. 
So it's just basically setting all this up so that now all I have to do, I don't have to mess with any of that stuff, don't have to mess with any of this stuff. I can literally just choose my articulation. So that's the actual staccato dig. Um, but hopefully that makes sense. So I'm going to look at the comments and see if that makes sense or if you guys have questions. Um, <laughs> all right. What do we have here? Uh, someone's asking if I'll upload this to YouTube as a normal video. Actually, I think it just does it automatically, and it should be in high quality. I'm streaming it at uh, 1080p, uh, and it should actually encode it in pretty decent quality. It's done that in the past. Um, I should notify you when you do a live stream. I don't know what the best ways to do that. I post it on Facebook, but I don't know if there's a better way. Let me know. Um, yes, I did get a new synth. I got this uh, Prophet 6. Uh, I bought it from Taylor, uh, so... It's kind of cool that it sort of stayed in the family, if you will. Um, do you back up the strings with pads? Not usually. It kind of like it'll it'll kind of make it a little cheaper sounding. And honestly, they have these ensemble patches that, if you want, um, can can be good to just sort of mock up an actual um, sort of more pad-like string sound. So here, let's open up. Uh, let's open up Contact real quick create a new instrument at the bottom here and I'll show you so in this specific thing they have the ensemble patch here and what I would do is I would take the long for example and just give that a second to load and, and then what will happen is oh wait gotta unmute that so that's a more like it's the entire the entire or all the sections I should say Violin one, two, violas, uh, cellos, and contrabass. All, you know, playing within their their uh, ranges. So up here, you're not getting any contrabass, but um, you have access to everything, and you could just play big chords. It's not necessarily the most realistic thing if you're going for detail, but if I was just going to put stuff behind, uh, you know, rock music or whatever, it's a really quick and non-RAM intensive way uh, to get that sound underneath it. And, you know, under that stuff you get less detail, so sometimes it's, it's the right thing, and that's what I would use instead of a pad. Um, but yeah. Anyways, that's not as much the focus of this. So, um, what you can see here, for example, let's say I select, let me just glue these and I'll select that. So in this part of the song, and it goes to pizzicato there. Something to note is that with um, the short patches, things that uh, are, are more percussive, the velocity tends to control the actual volume and the articulation because they record it at all all uh, dynamic levels, so it'll control that. But on the long on the long uh, patches like legato and long actually uh, the CC1 control so that's actually mapped um, on my keyboard I don't know if you guys can see but the mod wheel basically um, so that's what controls the volume and then the velocity will actually control the, the type of articulation so whether it's bowed legato fingered legato or portamento um, anyways uh, Moving on, let's see. 
do we have any questions about this stuff? Um, if you got Albion one, would you need to buy contact? Actually, Albion, Albion one. And, um, this is probably something that I should show you guys. So contact is, <laughs> it's, it's a thing. I mean, it's amazing, but there are some, some quirks to it. So there's two versions There's a free version and there is a paid version. The free version, you see all these pretty libraries here. Um, they'll all work with the free version. Um, if you have to load it through the, the files here, then uh, it'll only work with the paid version because you'll get a 15 minute demo timeout thing. Um, so um, any of these libraries here, including Albion One and these, uh, these Spitfire libraries, all these things that you could see in here will work with the free version of Contact, which is kind of nice because then you don't have to spend any money to get these libraries or any extra money to get these libraries working. Um, wide stereo imaging for strings. You know, honestly, um, I don't really need to do that. And, and uh, I've, I've noticed a lot of libraries do this, including the Spitfire ones. They record everything in situ. So basically, um, okay, I'll just show you exactly what I'm talking about. But like violin one is where it should be. I hope that on Facebook, you're actually getting a stereo stream. I know that when, when it uploads uh, after the fact, it'll be mono, but hopefully everyone watching live will actually get to hear. But that should be, like, off to the left. This is close to the center. I don't know, the panning on this seems a little bit less extreme than I thought it would be. But yeah, cellos are usually to the right, and contrabass all the way to the right. But I think the, you know, I have so much ambience in here that's kind of bringing it to the center. But generally speaking, like, it's left to right. If you look at an orchestra, that's how everything is. So if you do, like, you know, the close mics on these, let's see if that works. Let's see if this is working for me. Yeah, we don't have any close mics on this. See, it's all the way to the left there. We're just using the tree mics, which are a bit more, oh, so much stuff to go over. Sorry, guys. But <laughs> um, anyways, yeah, like, so everything's sort of spaced the way it would be if you were standing in front of um, the orchestra. That's how I like it. You could you could put a stereo image or a widener on it, but it might make it a little surreal. But there's no rules with this stuff. Do whatever you want, really. Um, have I tried out the Nexus synth? No, I've heard really good things. Um, but for synths, uh, honestly, like, my favorite synth I use is Serum. Um, but uh, that's less orchestral stuff and more electronic. We'll get into that stuff another day. Um, how's the brass ensemble sound in combination with the strings? Um, okay, so that's a fair point. Yeah, let me show you. Uh, let's uh, let's look at the brass. And the brass is actually something I haven't mapped just yet. But these are all doing legato patches, so it's fine. It's just what it defaults to. <laughs> So um, that what you're hearing there is trumpets, and I've actually got well trumpets, horns, trombones, bass trombones, and uh, and a tuba, and I've also got this uh, horn solo. I got it because the the horns here is actually a six means there's six of them, so it's very epic sounding, but a, a very different aesthetic from having this sort of solo one started out. Which I do love the sound. I mean, French horn, in my opinion, is one of the just best sounding <laughs> instruments. It just makes everything sound epic. So um, it, I, I really, I feel like I won't like a brass library <laughs> unless the horns are really good. But uh, they have uh, three different uh, types of horns in this library. They have the solo, they have an A2 library, which is a little bit more delicate. And then they have this uh, A6, six French horns playing, which is just, I think, so epic sounding. <laughs> And one thing I, I tend to do, and maybe this is lazy writing, maybe I'll, I'll find a better way to do this, but I really like to, um, this, this whole thing started out with just like this melody line up top. Wow. Well, let's listen to it before I messed it all up. <laughs> Sorry about that. 
Let's make this all legato. And this is often how I'll write, is I'll just come up with a melody line that I think sounds cool enough to sort of flesh out. And, you know, instant epic is to sort of double the uh, violin line with the, with the horn. I've noticed a lot of music that I like tends to do that. In this case, they're doing octaves. But it's sort of making that line very um, purposeful. Um, it, it, it'll make it sound less meandering. It'll make it sound like it's something that's got some weight to it. Um, and then, you know, I, I sort of flesh that out from there. Just like basically adding harmonies, you know? Which by itself, it probably sounds very strange. And it's the same thing with the horns, or with the brass, rather. Um, in this case, I've got uh, the trumpets doing the same line, but there's also, actually, I'm using lanes here. So I've got this polyphonic legato thing going, uh, and this is pretty handy. If you turn it on in um, any of these Spitfire libraries, it's a really handy feature, actually. Um, so I've got poly polyphonic legato times two there. And basically, it'll sort of detect anything that's low velocity here and make it its own separate line. So this one's all high velocity. So that's how it knows that the two lines are separate, but they're playing out of the same instrument. And you can see that visually uh, represented here. Let me select both of them. There we go. We had the horns playing there. Let's try that again. And this is literally uh, how I write this stuff. I mean, it's, th there's no purpose to this. This was literally written just to show you guys something. So I don't really know what I was going for, but just kind of started off with that melody line and I, and I was just seeing where it would go. So I was just adding more. All right, and then we got the uh, bass trombones here. And as you get lower, you're sort of defining the, the fundamental notes and in, in, in the chords. So that's like the tuba is basically your your bass. You know, it's your low end, and that's how you're gonna determine the the sort of context of of all of the, of the melody line, basically. crazy or yep this is not programmed to be legato this is kind of so you guys are seeing a work in progress so that's why there's messy stuff like this so this actually is not again these have to overlap to trigger the uh, legato transitions and one thing I'm doing which is extremely unrealistic right now but again in the interest of the stream it's not super important but um if I gave this to a tuba player, they would hate me because there's no space for breath. So you really need to... And because I don't play tuba, I don't really know what the exact amount of time is. I've been told, like, sort of just breathe out. And, like, when you're out of breath, that you could put a breath there. But, you know, that might um, that might still make the tuba player hate you if, uh, if you were going to send this off someone to play. Uh, but this is why, you know, if I was going to do this, I would work with an arranger who could sort of optimize this to be actually playable. Um, but for the interest of making a mock-up, um, it works fine. And 
that's everything in context there. All right, let's take a few more questions. Do I lean towards notation software or DAW for writing music? I am terrible with notation. Um, I know a lot of people who swear by that stuff. I'm just not good at it. Um, I can't read music. I, I, I can read music so slowly. It's just, so, I mean, like, you know, this is just, for me, this is what works. Like, I can visualize everything. I know how this works. So that's what I do. There is a score function on here. Um, which, yeah, score editor. You know, which will put it out like that. Um, I think most DAWs have something. And maybe, like, the arrangers, if I send them the MIDI, will will maybe look at it like that. Because it, it sort of saves you a step. Um, the cool thing is that if, technically... If I were to like, let's say, I specify a bunch of uh, articulations for stuff. Let's just do stuff at random here. I think it'll reflect that in the score. I think. I'm not an expert on this because I never use Yeah, but there you go. Like it's actually showing you. Though um, I've created my own articulations. They have like um, default ones, which would be represented in the sort of standard notation. Um, so this is kind of crudely written <laughs> up there, which I don't think a player would be too happy with. But uh, here, let's just undo all of that real quick. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, to answer that question, uh, let's see. How do I have my contact multis set up? I only have or use contact to load up individual instruments. So m multis are still a mystery. So, okay, that's a good question. So, um, okay, let's look. This is just violin two. I mean, to to do a multi, you just add multiple things. So here's just something that's in here. Okay, so now that's added there, F ensembles. And I guess it added in the middle there because I must have deleted something earlier. It tries to keep everything sequential to the best of its ability. Um, it's sequential relative to MIDI channels. So it's actually very easy to build these because if you just sort of start, you know, and let me let me open this one up because this has nothing on it. So if um, if we open this up, you'll see it's channel one. If I open literally anything else, uh, let's open up something small or smaller. I think that's one. Oh, did I misjudge that? That's probably a big patch, isn't it? But this will be two um, when it pops up. So that's that's two right there, um, and the next thing that I do if I open up anything else, let's try and find a small patch. Actually, that won't be very big. Uh, shorts. There we go. So that'll be three, and then the handy thing in um, Cubase is that you could just add two MIDI tracks after you click that. And it'll sort of understand that you're just trying to add it to this instrument. I mean, you can you can obviously specify it there, but that's a mess. But it sort of figured out that, like, yes. Okay, that's a string. That's that clavinet that I added. And then the horn solo. Horn solo. Oh, that's awesome. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's it sort of figured that out. So that now you have your multi there. And you have these three tracks controlling it. Now, I don't know how every doll reacts to that, but this is at least how Cubase does it. It's, it's very simple. So multi just means that you've got multiple instruments open. And then, um, you know, if you want, you can save as a new multi or whatever. This is a mess, so I'm not going to do that at all. Um, and actually, for Cubase users, I know not everyone's a Cubase user, and I'm sorry, I only have tips for Cubase users. But there's a lot of really handy features. Like all of these are track instruments, which is which is a really useful feature because it sort of creates this entity which is locked in to its own um, channel on the mixer. So all of this stuff is just represented. It's violins one that has its own channel there. So it's like a mix of an audio channel and a MIDI channel. And you can add more if you if you want to control things uh, separately. Again, I'm doing that through the use of articulations. So it makes everything really neat. And then what I can do, which I have done and I will do once I have a template, is select all this stuff, including the group track that the, it's going to and that's adding a little bit of a reverb, like this group track here. 
and I'll show you how I'm processing that in a second because I'm sure there's going to be some questions about that. But um, you can select all of those things and you do export and then you do selected tracks and you can save that as a track archive and then just recall all of this into any project at any point. So now that I have that saved, if ever I'm like, uh, oh, let's put some strings in here rather than having to set all this stuff up again or like copy it over from a template. I can literally just do import track archive. Fashion maps has everything. It'll even have any MIDI that I've, I've left um, and it'll just be ready to go. So that saves me a lot of setup time. And that's why I put the time into setting all this stuff up on the front end so that I could just sort of be like, oh, I'd like these strings today. And I've got that saved as a uh, track archive. Um, so. Anyways, hope that answered the question. I don't even remember if that was the question that was asked, but uh, let's see what else. Let's see. Let's look at Facebook. What are we saying on on Facebook? Um, can you buy my shirt? Yeah, you can buy. Oh yeah, it's a good tiger shirt. Good buddy. Good tiger. Um, know, for some reason, these comments on uh, Facebook are a little bit hard to navigate. Um, how do you set up the articulations in the MIDI edit editor? So I actually went over that earlier in the video. Um, and uh, this will be uploaded to Facebook and YouTube after the fact. So you can watch that because I went into detail. It's a, it's a pretty involved process. Save the session. Save it. Wait, I don't need to save the session because I haven't had anything useful. But normally I am very, very sort of uh, careful about saving all the time. Um, let's see. What video recording software? I'm, I'm using Wirecast. Um, the percussion section. So I don't have the percussion set. The two sections I'm missing, the two sort of basic sections I'm missing are the woodwinds, which uh, I'm probably going to set up with uh, Orchestral Tools Berlin woodwinds because it's just the best. It's just the best woodwind section in my opinion. Um, at least that I own. Uh, and that's a very, but it's unfortunately very, very intense. <laughs> like, I don't know if I had it set up if it would like work with with uh, Wirecast streaming, um, and I still need to set all that that stuff up. I'll do an update on this once I have that set up so you can hear the woodwinds. And the percussion is a little bit different. I really like a uh, Hans Zimmer percussion. Um, it, it's got a ton of hits, but that's a very sort of specific setup, and it's quite different from this. But once I get all that stuff ready, I'll be happy to show you guys how all that stuff is set up. Um... How much RAM does the Mac have? Okay, so that's a good question, and it actually brings me to a really interesting point. So this stuff, unfortunately, um, I mean, it sounds great, but it's so intense on the, on the, uh, your, on like basically every aspect of your computer, other than like maybe the video card. So um, let's take a look at my specs. Uh, so yes, I have um, I have the four gigahertz i7. I've got thirty two gigs of RAM. Um, now I don't actually use very much. I use this, uh, memory server. This is a feature of contact. Oh, I should actually show you guys this, man. This is going to be so educational. Um, <laughs> cause I had to figure a lot of this stuff out and there's a lot of resources online, but I, I sort of figured out what worked for me. So there's this memory server where you can actually load stuff into the RAM. So if I close this project down and then open it up again, um, it'll take no time to load cause it'll all be stuck in the RAM until I purge it. Um, and if I add a bunch of instruments and delete them, I can always purge it. It's only going to purge the stuff that you're not using. So there, I added some stuff, I deleted it. Now we're only using 2.8 gigs, but the reason it's using so few gigs, like if you look at, um, if you look at the size of some of these libraries, especially the legato ones, they're very big. So, uh, let's see, legato decorative library this is 30.33 gigs of samples. Now that's if you add everything on all the mics and everything. But still, it's probably about 10 gigs of what I'm actually using. But I'm not using, I'm only using 300 megs of RAM. And the reason I can get away with this is because I'm using SSDs. What they sort of figured out was that SSDs are so fast that they can stream. You can't do this with a spinning hard drive because it's too slow. But I have four SSDs with all my libraries hooked up to them. And what I did was I created this, um, this buffer size. So I don't know exactly what this means, but but what I do know is that it's only loading a small part of the sample 
into the RAM, and then the rest is just streaming from the drive. So that's why it's only taking up 300 megs of RAM and not, you know, the, the 10 that it would probably take if I was loading the full thing. And the other thing is that because it's only having to load 300 megs into the RAM, it loads pretty fast. You can imagine that loading 10 gigs into RAM would take forever. So um, SSDs are very, very important if you're serious about getting a ton of these libraries and running them. Um, if I were to bring this down to six gigabyte, uh, six kilobytes, it would be even smaller, ostensibly half the size. I don't know for sure, but um, I find that when you're running a lot of stuff, it's best to leave that buff, uh, let preload a little bit more and still using barely any RAM, considering that I have, you know, 29 gigs more to work with. Um, but yeah, you know, that's more of a safety net than anything. Uh, and, and if you want to go even crazier than that, you can actually like uh, hook up a PC or a Mac as a slave computer and use it just to process and just to run these. And I know some people who have like a ton of those um, and it lets your main computer just sort of, you know, organize everything. But uh, anyways, I'm rambling. Sorry if that's boring. Let's get on to some more questions. How long did this take to compose? Honestly, it did not take very long. Like um, it's, that's why it's kind of a mess. Uh, it's all legato. Like it's not really fleshed out, but, you just start with a melody line and you just kind of keep adding to it. It's like, I don't know, and maybe it's because I write music quite often, but, you know, in some ways it, like, opens up my creativity because I'm not working with distortion or, like, you know, sounds that really need a lot of work to just get to sound good. And you have so many more instruments to play with that you can really flesh out. I mean, if you see, like, everything that's going on here... Um, these are massive, massive chords. You know, I can't do that with periphery. I can't do that with a lot of instruments because it would just be a mess. And because all these instruments are different and have different timbres and sit in the mix, you know, both spatially and spectrally, um, it just it just makes it sound like a, you know, well, that's what an orchestra is. It's just a big, a big uh, instrument <laughs> at the end of the day. So that's what it that's what it sounds like. Um, all right. Let's see. Yes, I was rambling. Very good. Very good. Mark Holcomb would be proud. Um, let's see. Um, do you recommend saving libraries on a different hard drive? Absolutely. Um, and it, on this computer, I kind of have to because the main drive is a spinning drive because I was stupid. I messed that up. But um, generally, you know, your, uh, your main drive is handling so much stuff. It's just better and faster if your library is on a separate dedicated drive so it's just reading from that and not trying to read you know all the stuff that that's basically maintaining your your os and your daw and also trying to load in uh and stream uh, samples from so um what daw does everyone else use um nolly uses logic spencer uses pro tools so every periphery album is done in like the three major DAWs, which is kind of interesting, but we, we make it work. Uh, play your piece, please. I guess people who like just started watching now probably haven't heard. All right, we'll play one more time, even though it's long and boring. I'll answer text questions in the meantime.
All right. So there, for those just joining, that's the piece in question. Again, all this stuff will be uploaded to uh, Facebook and YouTube after the fact, so you'll be able to watch it on your own time. You just won't be able to interact. Um, so let's see. Um, there was a good question here. Yeah, is there a good starter library that has solar instruments for all the orchestra parts rather than the whole sections like Albion one? No, and here's why, because when you, you either have these libraries that have everything, so we're not, we're, we're looking at really specific libraries and, you know, maybe one of these days I could, uh, open up Albion one and show you, but like Albion one has these, these sections just divided into high strings and low strings, high strings and low strings. So high strings would be that violin one, two and viola, low strings are cello and contrabass. And, um, it's just, it's, for like quicker mock-ups or and it's an entry point like that's that was my entry point into the orchestral stuff and it sounds great but you just don't have the same level of uh detail with it um but i mean you can get amazing amazing results with it like it it, it shouldn't deter you but it's just you know I, I got kind of obsessed with this stuff so i really wanted to go in deep um you know when you consider that just this string library i think costs uh more than albion one which has everything uh, but it just allows you so much stuff uh, and, and you could do so much stuff with it that, you know, if you want to get very realistic with it, it's pretty much the only way that you can get those results. Um, but yeah, I'll go over, I'll go over the Albion stuff uh, in a, in a separate stream um, because it's really cool and it does have everything that you need. Um, if you guys are familiar with, um, with uh, Viscera from Haunted Shores, uh, that opening orchestral track I did, that was done entirely in Albion one. Um, so it, it, it's kind of cool. You can get entire things done. Um, but they, they don't really focus on the solo instruments because people who want sort of that detail want to be able to choose and, and, and mix stuff up. Like I've got a whole bunch of string libraries. Um, and I, I could go over those at some point, but like cinematic studio strings, that's an incredible, incredible library. LA scoring strings. That's a really up close like like uh this is like one of those libraries that everyone everyone has it's just a must-have library all these things you know they have their own flavors and everything and you can sort of just mix and match and see what works for you so it kind of wouldn't make sense to um force anyone into just choosing you know one thing that one company makes but usually they offer bundle deals if you want to bundle a whole bunch of stuff together so that may be a way of getting that i hope that makes sense um, the end bit's totally like something from Star Wars. Yeah, it probably is. I mean, like, it's like I literally put that together right before it started, uh, just so that I could show you guys some p pizzicato stuff. Um, that that's all John Williams, and John Williams is like one of the most insane composers of of, of all time. So, uh, you know, I'm sure it's in the back of my head at all times. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, how much does Prefer use Omnisphere? Uh, all the time. <laughs> Omnisphere, so I could go into Omnisphere one of these days too. Omnisphere is not really for orchestral stuff, but for, God, like everything else kind of. It's, if you were going to buy, like there's a lot of really specific libraries and I have a lot of stuff here that's good for like electronic, sound design, whatever. But if you're going to buy one library to kind of get you into that world, you'd be hard pressed to find a library that offers as much stuff as Omnisphere does at the price point that it does. Cause I think it's like maybe 400 bucks and it is, it has so many patches and so many sounds and they're amazing. They're amazing patches and they just sound huge and fit in, into everything with very little work. Um, and it has like, seriously, like, I want to say like, like over 10,000 patches or something. Uh, it, it's so much that like, it's probably the, the most difficult thing about it is just navigating like all the sounds. Um, not even navigating, but having the time to sort of audition everything because there's so many amazing sounds in there. So I definitely recommend that um, if you're getting into like the sort of more electronic or sound design uh, side of th things, like it's a really great starting point for that. Um, let's see, more comments. Do I do ambient tracks? Uh, you know, I don't think I do ambient tracks, but I think I'll have ambient parts. I have some libraries that are absolutely awesome from that. In fact, that would be a good one for a live stream one day, showing you guys the Evo libraries. But that will require its own sort of hour to cover because that's crazy stuff. And it's awesome. I use it a lot. Um, 
Have I listened to any actual classical composers for inspiration? If so, which ones are my favorites? You know, I was kind of raised on classical music, but it was all like what I'd call like pop classical music. So, you know, Beethoven, Mozart. Um, I think like I was exposed to like Mussorgsky. Is that how you say his name? You know, and like some uh, Rachmaninoff. And um, I mean, like all that stuff is pretty insane if you if you look at what's going on compositionally. And I think the the stuff about what I'd call like pop cla classical music is that it's really catchy, despite the fact that there's a lot of pretty crazy stuff going on, um, like very memorable. And that I think is just, um, I don't really know how to crack that. <laughs> you know, it's just, you got it or you don't, or you just, you know, when you, when you hit it, you know it, but it's, it's not something that I think that people can calculate. Um, anyways, let's see, let's see what Facebook is saying. Um, all right. Well, is there anything that you guys like? I, I have to unfortunately get ready for this. Uh, I'm gonna go watch the, the Caps game, they're gonna play the Islanders. Uh, so we're gonna go do that very soon. We have to leave soon. But is there anything that you guys want to know or see or want? Sliders, the, the ones like not these, um, sort of touch slider things. There are these rotary knobs, but I, you know, I just can't get the you can't really use those as expression sliders in the same way um but with that said i don't regret getting it like it it's uh, it's it's expensive but but i do love it it is absolutely like my, the best feeling um controller that i've owned um let's see have i ever considered getting some of those huge analog synths you must be talking about modular synths that is a rabbit hole that i am terrified of i'm really trying to stay out of that i have these synths here uh, and I have my virus under there, but like, um, yeah, uh, oh God, I hope not. I hope I never get into that. It'll be the end of me. Uh, Spitfire stuff work with the free, free contact. Yes or no. Only certain libraries do a lot of their stuff doesn't, but lately it seems like they've been focusing on that. Um, cause these are like their new, the, the vintage keys, this is Albion one, Sym uh, symphonic brass chamber strings. Um, those are newer libraries and they're sort of the more mainstream libraries and those they seem to make for the free version of contact. So anything that you see in this sort of list here will, uh, will work with the free version. Anything that you have to load through the file browser here, you'll need the full version of contact. Um, let's see. Uh, any thoughts on Metropolis Arc? So that's basically, that's orchestral tools. I wouldn't say direct competition with Albion 1, because uh, it does, it, it's coming from a different place, but it's like, uh, I, I I don't own it, but I've used it before, and it's really awesome. It's all loud. It's all recorded at the highest uh, dynamic level. There's aspects of that that I think are really, really cool. Um, I don't know if I can uh, justify the purchase, um, but I might actually pick it up. I might actually pick it up just because I like to have like options and it is a great sounding library. Orchestral tools do such a fantastic job and they have this um, brass library coming out called Berlin brass, which um, is probably going to be like the best thing ever <laughs> once it's actually out. Um, um, and, and I swear by their woodwind series, but they're, they're very in depth. They're usually pretty hard on your uh, CPU and your performance. Um, I could probably focus on that stuff on one of these uh, live streams. If I can get... I think that Nolly and I sort of work really well together because he's really good at things that I'm not very good at. And I, I think that I'm, I'm better at things that he really doesn't focus in. Um, I know that, like, although he's actually a really capable producer and when he, when, when he does it, like, he does a great job. I don't think he really enjoys that aspect as much. I think he really likes the mixing side of things and the engineering side of things. And that's the stuff that's really fascinating to, to him. And to me, that's that that was always a chore. I was never really that great at mixing. I'm still not that great at mixing um, and engineering and all that. Like all that stuff sort of getting in the way of the stuff which I like, which is the creativity. Like I just like to write. Um, so, so I think that's why we've always worked well together is because, you know, he kind of lets me focus on my strengths and I let him focus on his strengths. And they, it kind of fills out the puzzle pretty, pretty evenly then. Um, uh, let's see, let's see what, let's see what YouTube is saying. 
What's the cheapest way to get the full version of Contact? You know what? Um, I'd wait for uh, Black Friday because there's often a lot of sales going on. And I would tell you not to get Contact, but to get like the basic version of Complete. In fact, because a new version of Complete just came out, they uh, they put out the last version, which is actually the version I use, uh, Complete uh, Complete 10 Ultimate. They had that on sale for like 500 bucks, and that's normally like a thousand. Um, but that has contact and like a ton of libraries, a lot of which I, I use a lot. So um, like action strikes and damage and things like that. Um, so it's it's a really great starting point. In fact, that was really in some ways my entry point to the orchestra, sort of a taste of it. And then I was like, oh, but there's way better stuff out there. <laughs> um, but uh, that that would be the best way to get it for cheap, in my opinion classically trained i don't really know music theory or anything like that i just kind of do everything by ear and by trial and error which is a very frustrating and time-consuming process but i guess i'm stubborn and that's the only way that i can work you know um you got ultimate 11 would be worth getting con complete control keyboard i'd say if the most important thing to you is integrating with like uh complete control or, or with complete and there is that thing where it integrates perfectly and the lights all, all do that. If that's important to you, and if the most important thing on a keyboard is that the key bed feels really nice, yes. If you'd rather have like features and sliders and drum pads and things like that, I'd say no. It, there's probably better things out there and you and probably for less money. Um, I'm just, I just really like a nice key bed, so I kind of don't mind having less features. Once I felt how the keyboard felt in person, and maybe that if you can try it out in person, that might sway you one way or another but when i tried it out in person then i was like all right this is gonna be this is gonna be the one that i'm gonna have to get um uh i mentioned using the sound Eyer olympus choir once how do i like it i love it i it's one of the best choirs it's one of the most realistic choirs i could go into choirs one of these days as well um because there's some some good options out there um but but the sound Eyer, sound Eyer and olympus choir is one of those go-to ones like it seems like everyone just kind of uses that one um and it 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 sits really well i like i really like the vibrato that you can that uh, that they got on the performances it's just very dramatic it's very epic like not all of the the choir libraries go for the super epic sound but usually when i'm using a choir it's like double stuff on like a really epic part and so it has to cut and i really like the way that it cuts through the mix so that's why that's why i like that and olympus um, I think comes with the, the, the Venus, which is the women's choir, the, the Mars, which is the men's choir. I, I use the Venus one mostly and, uh, Mercury, which is the boys choir. So you do have a ton of options. Them very, very small sections, but we layered that over the top to do an actual, uh, orchestra is so expensive after all the fees would probably be two or three times what we spent on the entire periphery three budget just to give you guys some some perspective there so i mean i'd love to but it's it's something that we may have to um do at some point <laughs> um let's see have i been approached to score anything major but have to decline due to time constraints no not really i'll i make it a priority and i have some downtime now so if opportunities came i would definitely take advantage of it um, all right, let's see what, let's see if there's any other things, any questions about how this is routed, how this is working, um, before I leave, cause it's getting to that time. Why is there no sound all of a sudden? Oh, that's fun. Is it because of this? No, I don't know. I don't know why there's no sound. All right, whatever. Well, I guess that's going to be it for hearing what's going on here. Sorry, guys. But uh, i got to leave for the game in 15 minutes anyways. So thank you so much for watching. Um, if you have any questions, I might have answered it earlier in the video. This will be, again, uh, on the Periphery Facebook. And it's also on my YouTube channel. You'll be able to watch it, especially on YouTube in high quality. So um, I hope I was able to answer some questions. I'll be doing more of these and going more in depth with other, other libraries and other aspects of the template. So you can prepare questions for that time as well. But um, yeah, 
Thank you so much, guys, for watching. I appreciate it. Bye.